Coming up, NASA's next Mars mission is delayed, Europe wants to be part of an ambitious mission to Europa, and new plutonium is being manufactured for space missions. Tomorrow begins right now. Take three of the live show. Seriously, you need to watch live. Welcome to tomorrow, season nine, episode two for Saturday, January 9th, 2016. I'd like to thank all of the patrons of tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who've contributed $10 or more to this episode. We are a crowdfunded show. Every single dollar helps. Head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO for more information on how you can help crowdfund the show. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. I'm joined to my right, your left, by Jared Head, who is getting his mohawk back. It's coming back. Are you going to color it anything? The aerodynamics is returning. Well, it's so. not quite aerodynamic yet, though. It's, it's becoming a, a small element of aerodynamics. It's not a major element yet. Directly to my left, I've got Space Mike <laughs> over my shoulder. Hi, Space Mike. And then, of course, my Hello, beautiful, everybody. lovely, wonderful, and talented wife, Carrie Ann Higginbotham all the way on the other side of the table. All right, in fact, let's start with you all the way. It's like two feet. Let's start with you. <laughs> start with you. Uh, talk to us about what's coming up in San Diego. So, Space Up. It's that time of year again where we get to talk about Space Up. You coordinated it with a shirt and Added? everything. Ah! Look at that. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little big on me because I lost some weight, but we'll ignore that. Anyway, so Space Up, for those of you who do not know what a Space Up is, it is an unconference, and an unconference, unlike a traditional conference where you show up and they give you a packet listing all the different topics and all the different people who are going to be in all the different rooms and all the things that they're going to be talking about, Space Up is exactly the opposite of that. You show up and whoever's there is encouraged to give a talk or participate in a talk. Uh, and then you can decide on the topics, you decide on basically the schedule, which uh, rooms you want to be in, and then you you are deciding the entire structure of the event, which is really amazing. Um, and it's really cool. And this one happens to be about space. And Space Up San Diego is the original Space Up, and it is San Diego 5, or San Diego V, depending on who you're asking, I guess. Which yeah, is that, that's a really Roman numeral. Cool. Yeah, no, I know, but I like V as a, like, a peace sign, because I think that's really cool. All right. You know what? Sci-5. Sci-fi. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> there you go. Um, so, like I said, so everyone who attends the space up is encouraged to give a talk, moderate a panel, or start a discussion of some kind. You can find more information, of course, at spaceup.org. Also, they have a Twitter account, as you can see here, which is uh, twitter.com/spaceupconf. C O M C O N F. I can't talk. And there's also the twitter.com slash space up San Diego if you want something more specific about the space up San Diego. Well, well done, Dada. <laughs> good save. Yeah, no, that was good. I yeah, just, yeah that was really good. Um, anyway, uh, we are work in the works here at tomorrow at having making sure that the uh, we're going to be recording the T minus five talks, right. which are a little bit like uh, startup talks. Um, we literally talked to Jared like ten minutes ago. We're like, hey, would you mind going down to San yeah. Diego to capture T minus five I, talks? I will be at Space Up San Diego. We're also going to talk to our director. He's just awesome. now finding this out in real time. We're going to talk to our director and also Mike about going to Space Up San Diego because I think it's uh, it's it's really freaking awesome. So I'd love to send as many people as, as we can. Also, um, it is uh, it's the original Space Up. Yes. It was founded in yep. in San Diego, and we love to have as many citizens of tomorrow showing up to Sp Space Up San Diego as humanly possible. I think it, it, the more people at an unconference, the better it works, I think. Totally. And it's really kind of funny because uh, the year that it started, there was one, maybe two, I believe, that year. Last, last year, in 2015, there were 11 Space Ups, the majority of which, I think all of them, uh, were outside of the country. So oh, wow. it started right here nice. in San Diego, and then it has spread like wildfire. It's a lot of fun. We love them. We love giving love to Space Up. So there you go. Space Up is coming up. Oh, I don't think I ever told you when. It is <laughs> January 30th and 31st. It's going to be in San Diego State University in the Aztec Student Union. So very, very cool. Super excited about that. Speaking of almost awesome. missing scheduling, yes. Uh, let's head on over to uh, <laughs> uh, NASA's next Mars mission, Jared. Yes, I have some very sad, sad news, which is that NASA's InSight Mars lander, which was set to launch during a 26-day window, which was going to open on March 4th of this year, will not be making that launch window. Um, InSight is a part of NASA's Discovery class of 
scientific spacecraft. And InSight was supposed to investigate Mars's interior structure with multiple instruments, like a heat flow probe, which is actually going to, which was supposed to hammer down about 20 feet into the Martian surface and measure the amount of heat coming out to see how much would be coming from its core. And one of the most important instruments is a seismograph developed by the French Space Agency, um, and a very sensitive seismograph too. It was going to be able to go down to subatomic scales of measuring movement. Oh, really? that's cool. So if you can imagine, literally, like uh, 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 like half an atom's worth of movement, that is what it is going to be. What it was going to be able to detect on that's a lander that's on just, the surface of Mars. Yes, was going to detect things moving at half an atom. That roughly. is insane. Yeah. Now it is. It is ridiculous, and it's so ridiculous that problems arose in the design. <laughs> oh. It uses a spherical detector about Man. the size of a volleyball, and that interior, that entire interior has to have the pressure pumped out of it. You have to have a vacuum in there to about one billionth the atmospheric pressure of the Earth at sea level. Mm. That's how you're able to do that. Unfortunately, they detected a small leak occurring from several of those electrical connections for the sensors, so they were redesigned and installed to solve that, but then another leak began from the pressure vessel itself, and they couldn't resolve the issue in time for the March launch window. And because physics dictates that you have 26 days to launch or you're not going to be launching at all, yeah. they had to delay that launch, unfortunately. That's, that's truthish, truthiness to that. Yes. Well, I mean, it depends on the orbit in which you're going to take it yeah, to Mars, right? You can launch at any time. You you're could. Just, you're just going to have a difference in delta. Of the Energy the, expended. The difference in energy required will be yeah. greater or less. And obviously, we only have the capability at the moment to use the minimum amount of energy to get is it a Is it a very so. heavy payload? Is that why we it's can only not, do it? It's actually only about about roughly 350 kilograms, hmm. but still, the, the need to be able to get it there... In what, a reasonable you, what's amount its of time launcher? It. Do you know? Uh, it was an Atlas V in the 401 configuration, oh, so nice. just the just this just the common board, uh, common booster core, no solids attached to it, and it was actually going to launch from Vandenberg here in California, yeah. which would have made it the first interplanetary launch from Vandenberg. Oh, that well. would be sweet. So, which would have been nice, um, but it's been delayed now till May of 2018, and in fact, NASA's associate administrator for its science mission directorate, former astronaut John Grunsfeld, was asked about the possibility of cancellation of insight yeah. um, and he said that that is a question that's on the table because oh. they've spent 525 million dollars on the on that <laughs> nearly on a half already. billion dollars yeah half a billion dollars and it's cost capped at 625 million dollars oh. and you would have to store Gosh. insight for two years at conditions that would not allow it to get contaminated because if you send a spacecraft to Mars you have to keep it extremely clean in order to make sure that you don't yeah. cross-contaminate anything on Earth with Mars. For and, now. Yeah, for now. And that's immensely expensive to do. So you can imagine keeping that in that kind of a clean room for two years. Sure. So, and then also yeah. the delay on operations and other things like that. And it may end up, unfortunately, uh, causing that mission to be canceled. And a lot of scientists are irked about it because it was chosen because its technology had a low risk of development for it, which uh, turns out... Not so much. Creating a vacuum on an alien surface is harder to do than we thought? Yeah, it turns out if you want to have a vacuum that's one billionth the atmospheric pressure of the Earth, then it's a lot more difficult than you expect. So, Speaking of things that are difficult but kind of awesome, how's that? Yeah. Uh, uh, Planetary Resources over at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, uh, this last week actually, revealed that they have 3D printed using materials from an asteroid, which I suppose once it enters into the Earth's atmosphere becomes a meteor, yes. a meteorite. Uh, but uh, check this out. This is 3D printed uh, from an actual asteroid using something called direct laser metal sintering, or DMLS. It's the same general 3D printing process you use to 3D print, say, a rocket engine or something similar like that. Uh, this is a pulverized powdered uh, process system using a 3D Systems Prox X DMP 320 Metals 3D printer. Easy for me to say. Uh, it's the first part ever printed from stuff from outer space. Now you might be familiar with like Made in Space, mm -hmm. which is where we 3D print things in space. This is basically the exact opposite. We took material that you would normally find in space and made a 3D object from that material here on Earth. Uh, it's from the uh, source from the Campo del Cielo impact near Argentina, and it's composed of iron, nickel, and cobalt. And so that's kind of what you would find in a general asteroid somewhere out there. It's actually very close to like a steel, sort of. 
yes. uh, here on Earth. Iron metallic. So, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so uh, this design that they printed is kind of similar to what you'd expect them to print for maybe something out in space. And why this is cool is that if we're going to become a spacefaring civilization, if we're going to do things out in space, we need to be able to utilize the resources out in space. We can't just be coming back to Earth, grab the things we need from Earth, and loft them all up into space. We need to be able to find water in space. We need to be able to 3D print things in space, be it um, a new thruster pod or something, or a new uh, have mod, whatever, we're going to need to be able to create these things, and 3D printing is a really great way to create a lot of these strings, so it's really, really exciting. Now, I'm not sure how well direct metal laser sintering will translate into space, into zero or microgravity, simply because of the outgassing process. I think we actually had Dave Mastin on mm -hmm. once talking about that, and um, it's fairly, it's a little more complicated than the uh, process of 3D printing, like what Made in Space is doing, is that mm -hmm. additive printing. Direct laser metal sintering is more of a, um, it's also additive, but you have like these beds. I don't know, has anyone, you guys know how that works? You have a, no, basically you have, metal. so what you do is you have a, a canister basically of um, powder, mm -hmm. right? So you take this, whatever it is, this asteroid, and you grind it up to a very fine powder, and you put it and you layer it all the way on this, this base area, and then you shoot it with a laser in the shape that you want to build. So you shoot it and then you kind of lower it down and add a new layer of powder and you shoot the next layer and you go back and forth. Cool. Well, doing that in space would be hard to do because how do you keep, you know, on Earth we just use gravity to let it move down. On In space, how do you do that? Yeah. So we need a new form of direct metal laser all I, can, all I can imagine is this sort of like weird box with all this powder in it, you know, kind of like a sand sort of situation, and then a laser going, like, <laughs> 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 somehow magically something comes out of that. Like, it's, it's, I know that's totally not the way that that would work, but that's the only like so image I get in my I, head. I guess my point is this is very cool, and this is a, absolutely a first step. We're missing a second step. And then the third step is we print in space. Uh, hopefully they've got an idea as to what that second step is. But you need to get, obviously you need to do these in order, right? Yes. You, yeah. just, you don't just go from nothing to something. And so this is that first step on being able to 3D print. It proves we print. can take, take the meteorite or take the asteroid, grind it up, and make something out of it. Absolutely, yes. and that's a big deal. That's huge. So now we need to fix the next big deal. And once we do that, uh, what we'll be able to do in space in creating parts will be incredible. Mm -hmm. I think it'll open up a whole new area of what we'll be able to do just like in exploration of space. I think that is kind of the thing that will help open up the cosmos. So yeah. that's why I'm super excited about this. Something that I think is really interesting about this too is uh, the kind of um, traditional additive 3D printing is actually something relatively new. And the whole laser uh, metal sintering is actually something that industry has been doing since I believe the 80s. It might be early 90s. So this type of 3D printing is a little bit more understood than the, um, uh, the kind of new type where they're just using simple plastics or something like that. So there might be some kind of uh, insider secrets that we might not be aware of of how they would be able to uh, get around some of those problems that you brought up. Maybe, uh, Maybe. you know, it's, it's a hard, <laughs> there are hard problems, right? The outgassing problem is a big one. Absolutely. Uh, you, you, and you, you know, that, that's a really big problem in space. And then the floating powder, uh, that's also a very big problem. Yeah. Uh, I think these are solvable. There are Absolutely. other technologies that you can use or, or next generation technologies that maybe don't use the powder in that way. Um, I just, I haven't seen them yet, but I'm sure someone's working on it, possibly planetary resources or that very long name, uh, 3D systems. I'll just call them 3D systems. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe they're working on something. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Mike, why don't you talk to us about other innovative projects going on? So, uh, speaking of kind of a different type of innovative project, the European Space Agency is actually having second thoughts as to whether they're going to commit to continue operations at the International Space Station all the way to 2024. NASA, the uh, Russian Space Agency, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, as well as the Canadian Space Agency have all agreed to continue operations up until 2024. The last kind of ending date of operating at the ISS was 2020. And and as of right now, kind of the two uh, leading nations in the European Space Agency, France and Germany, are debating whether or not it's going to be worth it to continue operations at the ISS. Right now, the big focus is on their next generation rocket, the Ariane 6, and a whole bunch of other science missions, ExoMars, which is a partnership they have with Russia, being one of them. And so with a lot of these different things on the table, there's a couple different factors that uh, might increase their normal operating costs. In the past, uh, they did have more money that was that was going towards uh, their human spaceflight operations, but they also had a barter system with NASA. 
for uh, sending up astronauts and kind of their share of the costs of operating the ISS, they would send up cargo flights with their automated transfer vehicles, the ATVs. And since after five flights, the ATV is now retired, they kind of renegotiated a deal to use instead the service module of the automated transfer vehicle on the future Orion spacecraft. And even though the Orion is not going to be going to the International Space Station, NASA has agreed to allow that to be part of uh, the European Space Agency's monetary commitment towards the space agency. And if they don't have some sort of barter deal like this, then they would have to pay that sort of money. Recently, France did increase the amount of spending towards the human spaceflight uh, program, but it still wouldn't be enough if they didn't have this barter deal in place. So, uh, as of right now, there isn't anything that can really be agreed upon until all the different uh, heads of the different space agencies in Europe meet in a big meeting that they'll have in December uh, in Lucerne, Switzerland. And at that meeting is where they're going to have the opportunity to decide whether or not they're going to continue operations at the ISS through to 2024 or to rather increase their focus on the next generation rocket and other projects that they have. So until December of this year, um, there isn't going to be any official word as to what they're going to do, but we're just going to have to wait and see until then as to what sort of uh, motivations and, and agreements that they come to and hope that they don't bluff with each other enough to kind of uh, shoot themselves in the foot, so to speak. So as of right now, that's all that we have for that. But uh, um, speaking of some other really cool stuff that uh, Issa definitely does want to be a part of, I'm going to pass it back over to uh, uh, Carrie Ann, who has a really, uh, or excuse me, uh, Jared, who has a really cool story about a future science mission they want to be a part of. Yes, and we're very excited because the new NASA budget has increased and there are certain things that are increased in the increase of the budget as well. And one of those is the Europa Clipper mission that is being worked on at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, it was originally earmarked for $30 million in that initial NASA budget, but Congress upped that to $175 million. So essentially, Europa Clipper is fully underway in development for a launch no earlier than 2022, most likely on the space launch system. Now this mission is going to cruise to Jupiter in less than two years, assuming that the space launch system is used, and then it will go into orbit and make up to 45 close passes of Europa. Seems now, like seems like a, using SLS is a bit of overkill for that, is it not? It the space would be. System? It would be. Yeah. A, Sorry. Yeah. It would be a bit of overkill, but using an Atlas V in its most powerful configuration would require a six to seven year cruise. Oh, okay. on the way to Jupiter. Um, so then the Atlas V is still on the table, mm -hmm. if you will, for that, but obviously they want to give some justification for utilizing the space launch system um, <laughs> with it. And I feel like that's a really good way to do it, it because it just get it there. What's, you know? it what's it reduce the transit time to? Uh, it reduces it to two years instead of, instead of uh, five yeah, to six years. That's fair. So yeah, and if you think about the operations cost while you're on your way to uh, your your target wherever you're heading that reduces the cost of your mission too sure. that, that makes um, sense so there's currently an estimated 250 kilograms of usable excess mass so that means that you could potentially build a lander to put on there within that mass margin mm -hmm. and in fact the jet propulsion laboratory is looking at that because some congressional representatives have hinted that they may get more funding for that project if they include a lander for that and if that wasn't enough for you the european space agency <laughs> but wait there's more yeah but wait there's more <laughs> um the european space agency has contacted nasa declaring official interest in providing the lander for this mission which they estimate would cost about 550 million dollars this whole mission just by itself if we just launched Europa Clipper in its current configuration would be about two billion dollars so this is definitely a flagship project and the uh, the help from the European Space Agency I, I would imagine that would be uh, very well accepted and we'd be very happy to collaborate with them on that yeah you know how they might be able to power that lander Yes, by using plutonium. Plutonium. That's something. right. So a, as many people know, the uh, United States basically stopped plutonium production in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the first time in nearly 30 years, we have created a sample of plutonium-238. Huzzah! Now this is a big deal. because, And actually, it's a very, very small sample. It's 50 grams or 0 0.1 pounds of sample inside of there. So it's a very, very small, it is a sample. It's basically proving out that we can do this again and that we have the system 
systems necessary to make it work. Uh, plutonium-238 is a radioactive isotope that's used for deep space missions on NASA spacecraft and landers and rovers and things like that. For example, um, the um, Na uh, Curiosity uh, thank has, you. has a... Mar uh, I'm like, the thing, it moves on Mars. Curiosity, <laughs> Curiosity. Uh, yes. We just went to Pluto with New Horizons. Yeah. Also used it. Uh, we also went to... Um, uh, Galileo, one of the Tons of Jupiter stuff. missions. Cassini has them. Basically, so, if you're yeah. out in space, you're probably using, using a radioactive uh, isotope to make that happen because you can generate lots and lots of power for a very, very long time without a lot of weight. All of these things are very important for space-bound missions, and now we can actually do this. Uh, and this was all done in the... Um, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy is the department that oversees it, although it was taken over by NASA, and it is done in what facility? The Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, I lost it in my notes! <laughs> uh, NASA's actually spent more than $200 million keeping the capability from the Department of Energy online just to, like, be able to generate this plutonium. Eventually, they need to be able to generate a lot more. Uh, they're hoping to be able to generate um, 1.5 kilograms or 3.3 pounds every year or so. Eventually, they want to be able to create 35 grams, I'm sorry, 35 kilograms of plutonium, which is about 77 pounds. I'm sorry, that's actually in their stockpile. Let me try that again. I have failed this story miserably. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> they can produce 400, we're going back up my notes. They could do 400 grams now, or nearly a pound. All right, that's, I'm sorry, they can't do that now. They're gonna do that in the near future. 400 grams, about a pound. They want to get to about 3.3 pounds annually. That's where they want to get to. They have 77 pounds in its stockpile. To put this into perspective, the Mars 2020 rover, which is a basically the sister to Curiosity, mm -hmm. will require about 4 kilograms or 8.8 .8 pounds. So one vehicle requires 8.8 .8 pounds. Mm -hmm. Man. <laughs> Do better than that. Well, that, that story didn't quite go as planned. No! <laughs> it didn't! <laughs> I derailed my own show. Don't, don't, don't worry, Ben. We'll get it in post. Go, we will not fix that in post. Carrie Ann, save me. So uh, I chose this story because I thought that Lisa would enjoy it. Slash, I thought Lisa would be proud of me. So hopefully I don't screw it up as badly as Ben just did. <laughs> there are some... There's some moldy plants on the International Space Station. Ugh. Gross. Well, I know. Mold Nasty. all over the International Space Station. Yeah. Well, yeah. So uh, this tweet, as you can see, came out from uh, Commander Kelly not all that long ago. I believe it was December 27th, where he's talking about how his plants are looking a little sick, and he's going to have to mark Watney the the snot out of it. And uh, <laughs> anyway, so for those of you who've seen The Martian, that's that's or have read The Martian, that's a, a reference to that, obviously. Um, there are four zinnia plants that are moldy and the veggie experiment aboard the International Space Station. And uh, the so Scott Kelly reported it around, uh, I can't talk either, apparently around December 22nd. So the veggie project manager is Trent Smith and he's down on the ground and he was trying to manage the water problem from the ground by increasing the fan speed because he noticed through pictures that Scott Kelly had been taking that there was too much water uh, on the outside of the plants and inside of the veggie experiment itself. And it was right around that time that Scott Kelly said, hey guys, by the way, uh, it's kind of moldy. So what's the deal? <laughs> Gross. So uh, since then, uh, Scott Kelly has been labeled a commander or he's been designated commander of the veggie experiment to hopefully cut down on that that lag time between, hi, I'm seeing something. Yes, we're working on a thing. Okay, we have to give the the command to the fan to produce, to be, you know, at a higher speed. So hopefully it'll help with that. Commander, so Commander Veggie Kelly? Yeah, basically. So that's a Commander Veggie Kelly can just go in and go, <laughs> more fan speed, please. Thank you. Uh, he's also in the process of making sure he's wiping down and sanitizing the experiment <laughs> and the plants and wiping off any extra water so that to kind of help with all of that. The um, moldy plants are going to be bagged up by Kelly and are being stored in a freezer. They're going to be returned on SpaceX CRS 8 later on this year for analysis. Each pillow, you can see that they're doing much better now, which is really nice. Each pillow, or each sort of like little segment there, has actually two seeds. There was a sort of a main seed per pillow, and then what they call a quote-unquote stealth seed, So, which I thought was hilarious. So it's basically just making sure that if one didn't go, that the other one, you know, had a chance kind of thing. And so out of the... I forget what it is, but out of like the six or eight of them, again, each with each with two stealth seeds in it, uh, four of them were moldy, but three of them are still doing really, really well. 
which is kind of huh. cool. One of the first veggie experiments was up in 2014, and that was the one that they got the lettuce from. That they've so they've har harvested two crops of lettuce from that veggie experiment. And um, and for those of you who are asking, okay, well, lettuce and zinnias, like what do those two things have in common? The zinnias are actually sort of a precursor plant for dwarf tomatoes, and then those are going nice. to yeah, those will be going up in the veggie for 2018. So they should be able to eventually. We're trying to learn how to farm that yes. in space. That's what this whole we're trying to, deal. We're learning is how about. to build things in space. Yeah, we're learning how to create food in space. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's all kind of coming together. It, it is. is. It's kind of it's exciting. It's, it's finally really exciting. upon us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Space salad. Space, space salad. salad. Mm. Ah. That sounds delicious. It makes me. It makes me wonder if R2 is uh, dexterous enough to help out with these plants at all. Because as far as I know, he's just kind of sitting in a storage locker up there somewhere. Yeah. You guys know what I mean by R2, the yeah, Robonaut not R2. 2? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. R2-D2. <laughs> right, not R2-D2, exactly. Not short for R2-D2 um, or R2-KT. Um, yeah, no, I, you know, I, I don't I don't actually know. I, I think at this point it does still probably take a little bit of a human touch to be able to look at it and analyze and say, okay, there's too much water there. What do we do now? Um, but other than that, it's fairly hands-off. Uh, you know, each little pod kind of has their own little fertilization, and it's pretty much just water and fan, uh, you know, airflow at this point. Johnny Boy brings up an interesting question is, will a tomato be like a perfect sphere in space? Right, because I know they're kind of squishy. I wonder if they'll actually sphere size themselves. A little bit. I mean, the, Maybe. I, I wonder how they'll actually look. They still have the stem part, right? Then it has to grow out from the stem. So sure. I, I, just, I wonder what microgravity will do to the growth of a tomato. We I mean, are it, talking about dwarf tomatoes as well. And when you look at cherry tomatoes, they have a much better chance of looking a little bit more spherical. Yeah. So it depends on the plant. I would imagine the shape of a plant might be genetic as opposed to envir environmentally influenced, I if, wonder if, if you will. But I, I also, I don't know. I'm not a, like right. a botanist or anything like that. So yeah, I, have I don't no idea. know. Yeah. So. I wonder what would happen. This is, I guess we'll have to cover it when it happens. Oh, yeah, we'll have to. It'll be really cool. <laughs> a live tomato cam from the International <laughs> Space Station. <laughs> that would be kind of amazing. It would grow really fast, too. It's, it's sort of like Everything those else. little like baby eagle cams, right? You've got the... Or the, the camera. Shiba Inu cam. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, exactly. I think it'd be really interesting. That Space really tomato interesting. cam. Exactly, exactly. Space cam. All yeah. right, well, uh, let's turn it back on over to Mike to talk about some lunar exploration ideas. So yeah, um, uh, kind of going back to Europe, uh, the European Space Agency, well, first of all, this all started off with their director, Johan Warner. He made a speech at, in, back in October of 2015 in Jerusalem, um, pretty much announcing a plan for what he's calling the, the Lunar Village or Moon Village. And with this plan, uh, just recently, the European Space Agency has released a new video, a really nice video actually, kind of detailing their plan. First starting off with robotics and then having human landings until eventually Eventually, they would build villages or, or small moon bases near the South Pole and try to harvest water from some of the craters where, uh, it, that are permanently shadowed and where we know there's water ice. And with this whole plan, the different uh, nations of the European Space Agency have said nothing about it. They just don't want to comment on it at all. And pretty much uh, those who, who have talked about it are just like, this is just Johan's plan. Like, we're uh, not officially going down this road just yet. However, that being said, there are some officials at the European Space Agency who have drawn up lots of different plans for uh, robotic missions to go to the moon. And they want to start cooperating with Russia, China, India, and pretty much anyone who will be able, willing and, and wants to be able to participate them, with them, especially since NASA is mostly going to be focusing on Mars. And that's their whole fear, is that NASA is going to be too busy focusing on Mars stuff to be a whole part of this lunar plan. But uh, um, even though uh, they aren't officially going down this road, they will have the opportunity to discuss this again in their big meeting in December. And uh, again, all the same sort of factors kind of weigh in as to uh, kind of weigh uh, against this whole plan being adopted. You know, working on the next gen Ariane 6, the ExoMars, possibly Europa Clipper, and a whole bunch of other missions. However, one interesting partner or, or a possible partner has come forward. And this is actually someone from the United States FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. And pretty much uh, for this, it's the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee, part of the FAA. And they have expressed interest on how they would be able to allow United States private companies in 
participating with this whole plan of Europe. So that might be a really interesting partnership that comes about. If NASA or any other worldwide government space agency doesn't want to participate in this plan, I know of at least a handful of American companies, private companies, who definitely want to go to the moon and go and do the same things that this, that this whole plan is talking about. So that might be a way that the, we would see this plan become a reality. So that's something that I find really interesting. And, and again, we're just going to have to wait and see if this plan continues to develop. However, the director, Johan Warner, is probably going to continue to push this as hard as he can until some sort of support for it materializes. So uh, and that's it for, uh, uh, for this particular story until uh, we have more information. All right, thank you, Space Mike. Now we're going to take a quick break and show you a launch calendar of upcoming launches this next week. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about our main topic, which is how to prevent things like hashtag flat earth. Uh, so, and that's your fault, Ma. We'll describe what all that I'm is. I'm very sorry. All of that is all about. So stay with us. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our main topic, I did go on to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who've helped make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who've contributed $5 or more to this episode. If you'd like more information on how you can help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. And speaking of Patreon, we are like 50 some odd dollars away from our next Patreon goal for the SpacePod campaign. That's right. And what that will do when we get that, that next $50, which brings us up to $500 per month, uh, that will enable us to do two more space pods per month, which comes out to about one per week or four per month. Yep. Uh, so that'd be a really exciting thing. So 50 people contributing $1, Right, five people contributing ten dollars, or any combination in between, will help us get to our next Space Pod uh, campaign goal. That's a separate campaign from the main Tomorrow Live shows. That's over at Patreon.com/slash Space Pod. I'm really excited because I think that we're going to hit that. I, I hope we hit that in January. I, I hope we really hit it cool. too. It would be nice to do that for February might. and come back. Yeah, it'd so. be really really cool. So we'd we'd love to see that. Uh, love to see that happen. And thank you to all of our patrons who will make all of our shows happen. Thank you guys. We couldn't do it without you. I feel like a PBS uh, and viewers <laughs> like you. you. All right, let's Hello, go, neighbor. <laughs> let's go ahead and get started with our main topic. Uh, how did this come about? What you tweeted something out. <laughs> this is your fault. Okay, so I was on. I'm on Twitter a lot, and you can like talk me. You're at Jared on, like, Head. At Jared Head, just my name. Um, and I really love in interacting with people on it and talking with them. And I saw some of my friends were talking about flat earthers, which are these people who think that the Earth is not round and it's actually flat. I know, like you would think that that we abandoned that about you know 2,000 years ago, but apparently not. Um, so do you know how, how they how, in this flat Earth, how do you not fall off the side? How I don't do, know. Wait, wait, how does gravity work? I don't know. Because if I, you hit the... It just comes down. I can't, like... Like, I laws can't. of physics stop... There are things that stop working if you assume it's flat. Like, not to be insulting, but I can't, like, lower myself down to that <laughs> level of physics to think with that, you know? like it's There really, are no physics with that. Because the there problem. isn't. Yeah, there's no basis. All there's right. no way for it to... Be the whole thing is that the whole entire universe doesn't even exist. Like, all there is is this uh, flat rock that we're on. And actually, the rock actually <laughs> continues on beneath us. And beneath us is hell, uh, where all the demons are. And, Apparently. like, the sun is actually, like, one one billionth its size. And it's just this kind of light that, that is orbiting in a circle in a halo orbit above us. Same thing with the moon, just in a, in a tighter one. But wait, and wait, it's wait. ridiculous. And they use this map that is something like 4,000 years old that's from some sort of Kabbalah thing from like Jewish history that uh, shows the world in, in this kind of flat configuration. And the other thing that like really like fuels the fire to this is that map is the symbol that is used for the United Nations. They're like, United Nations knows it's flat. Why can't you believe it? It's ridiculous. I bet Nicolas Cage is working on it right now. But in that, in that environment, <laughs> so. that means that there's a point in time in which there is no sunlight on the Earth, right? Wouldn't there have mm -hmm. to be? Apparently. 
But it would have to happen all at once. Right? Right? Yeah, the light turns off. The light would have to turn off at some point before it turns back on. Is that incorrect? Anyone know? <laughs> I, I, I think know. they see there's like no, no, a spotlight, no, 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 and it's only spotlighting here, on certain parts the of the way earth. Over as here, it I'm not going to be able to see it. Obviously. Is that the thought pro? Because I'm, I'm like, we can it's just too far. we can super disprove flat Earth real quick with a single video conference to Japan. No, I mean no, that, that's no, all it would take. No, 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 no. Because I live here. If this is the disc, right? I live here. And the sun is over here because it's obviously like nighttime by me and daytime by Japan. Okay. I will be able to see that light. Clearly. Like this. Obviously. Uh, obviously. Duh. As you the know. reason. All right. You're thinking to yourself, self, how in the world is this on tomorrow? And how is this a topic for a space show? <laughs> Bear with me. Let me come full circle. Full disc? Full, full, full. flat. Uh, the idea <laughs> is the easiest way, in my opinion, to get rid of. The conspiracy nuts, because ultimately this is a conspiracy, right? Because they want to believe there's a conspiracy, that everyone's lying to them. Yes. And it's something that we hold to be a general truth, which is the world is round. Obviously. And that there, right? You, there's a reason you lose the ship over the horizon after about 20 miles or so. No, no, that none of that's real. None of that's real. Uh, and that ultimately there's a conspiracy. We didn't land humans on the moon. It was all faked. Clearly. Conspiracy. It was the on the internet. Easiest way, including all satellites. All sat. No, no rockets don't work in space. The, the all easiest space flight way. Is fake. Uh, yeah, the <laughs> easiest way to get rid of this is to make it so that regular mere mortals, not the super rich and famous, not yes. the the people like selected that go through years of training, you, me, everyone watching the show, anyone who wants to, you solve this by giving them access to space. Mm -hmm. Let them fly to space. Go up on a blue or now this won't now, I know what you some people are correctly thinking there is nothing you can say to convince certain people that the world is not flat. That is true. Yeah. We're not talking about those people. No. There are some people who maybe believe the world is flat because they want to believe in the conspiracy, and then if you can actually show them, be like, nope. No. See? They will then no longer believe that. And maybe they will hopefully change your life around. But so, all right, flat Earth, that's the thing. I feel like that's probably a very small subset of yes. our... Oh, uh, oh, it's huge. It's huge, dude. It is taking over YouTube. In fact, I have been getting personally attacked and trolled by flat earthers for over two years now. And I have like had to like report them and get their channels taken down. They got my monetization permanently disabled. They've tried to take my channel down several times. And every time, all I do is just write a simple email. And they're just like, oh, okay, you're obviously a victim of some fraud here and restore my channel. But this there, this is a huge community. It is much bigger than you think. I've, I've every, okay, Occasionally we'll bring this up, but it's a lot bigger than you think. That's insane. Uh, but yes. the one that is bigger than I always think is the We Never Landed on the Moon. Yes, that wonderful group of people. That's like 50% so. of the population. It's a very large group of people who think that maybe there was, not necessarily that we didn't land on the moon, but maybe there is question is as to whether there was a conspiracy there it's a much larger population than you think it should be yes. and the easiest way to get around this is to send humans into space actually Dada, i i got off topic i know you had something to say i just i was on a roll so go ahead and and what was your point um rather rather than just sending them into space like a suborbital flight in order to prove that the earth is round you need at least one orbit so we need to send him to orbit. Well, baby steps. I mean, you're not wrong, but I think, well, no. Because oh. what you're aiming for is the overview effect. That's yes. That's what you're aiming yes. for. But it has been talked about a number of times. I have a quote from Phil Plate, so I apologize. I'm just going to head down and read this really quickly. It says, there's a state of mind called the overview effect that almost every astronaut experiences. It starts off slowly at first. Each astronaut delights in seeing their own hometown from orbit, then perhaps a day later, their entire region. And then sometime later... So when they see their home country that they start to feel it. Eventually, that's it's supplanted by another broader feeling. Borders slip away, the sense of ownership over a particular piece of land fades, and they find themselves a citizen not of a nation, but of an entire world. Which means you can't just go up for 20 seconds and come back down and have the same kind of overview effect. Okay, I accept that, but... We also have to do this in baby steps, right? Yes. We can't yes. just send people yes. low cost into orbital flights yes. tomorrow. That's not a thing. Right. But I, I'd be willing to bet we can do high cost suborbital flights within two years. <laughs> within two years. Sure, six months. We're only about six months I, out. Six it's months fine. Out. Yep. Right? But yes. someone will get there, right? 
eventually someone will get there. And then it's a moment, and then you got to drive that cost down. Right. And then as that cost comes down, you need to start figuring out the orbital side of it and driving that cost down. Yes. And getting, and I think the easiest way to get rid of these conspiracy theories is to just do it and make it available for everyone to experience, not just the elite few, but for absolutely everyone. And once everyone can experience it, you, people don't, I would, does anyone deny gravity exists? Is that a thing? I don't deny it. Is there a hashtag fake it. gravity? Yeah, fight. I, I, we all fight it. But yeah, there's no. There gravity. are some people. Are, are there? <laughs> is that a real? Yeah. thing? Yeah, like there's no such thing as gravity. It's only magnetism. Gravity is not a thing. It's all magnetism. <laughs> 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 it's a small uh, crowd, yep, but there, there yep. is a crowd. But it's a small yep. crowd. It's a small yep. crowd. It's not a large crowd, right? Really? Definitely not as big as the flat Earth. I just. I just uh, googled gravity is fake and six million results came up. <laughs> six million. I'm now sad for humanity. I <laughs> feel terrible. That was my entire point was if we can get people, I actually, it serves ooh, as- ooh, ooh. Gravity is not real. Artificial gravity, fake gravity falls leak, uh, fake gravity in space. <laughs> All of those are also uh, suggested. Simulated for me. gravity actually is one. I, I, I would have hoped that simulated gravity would come up in that uh, that particular list. Anyhow, that was my. Uh, so along these same lines, uh, the, along these same thoughts, uh, I was thinking of adding a hashtag to every show. For example, this show would be hashtagged Flat Earth, and I put it like on the. Uh, I can't really point to it, but on the bug, like right above or beside the bug, it'd be hashtag Flat Earth. And when you tweet the show, you'd have to re reference hashtag Flat Earth, which means that whatever crazy conspiracy theory <laughs> is out there is now taken over by an actual show with real some real science behind it. Yes. I ooh, also. Yeah, ooh, go ahead. Ooh. Uh, I I. Googled, is gravity real? And I came up with 184 million results. I, this just makes me sad. We're not going to, yeah. This is depressing. Be careful. I'm wondering what, I'm wondering what the title of this video is going to be. Because it's, if it's something like, why flat earthers are wrong, I, uh, this video is going to go viral. I swear. Yeah, that, We're going to get so much and that's hate. What I told but it's the, wrong, I, it's the wrong kind of viral. There you go. Right? You, you don't want to have... There are certain people who just want to be right. They just want there to be a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And in okay, we just need to get them off the flat earth thing, off the anti-science thing, so that we can actually, as a civilization, kind of move on. Yeah. And again, the best way to do that is to just prove to them, be like, no, no, look, yeah. here, with your own eyes, your own senses, here is the earth, it is round. We yeah. have pictures of it, that doesn't work for them. So they need to actually see it themselves. Some people will say, oh, you're just simulating this with a screen. Yep. I don't know how we're simulating the microgravity, but whatever um, yeah and it's all know, in the pool you man you shouldn't definitely you can see the bubbles and flakes of stuff going everywhere it's all in the pool it's all fake <laughs> <laughs> and also at least that's what i hear there was some talk in our chat room about the fact that we shouldn't give these people the the time of day in order to discuss it but i think you do because if you if you don't address a really like just like fundamental educational thing that you should understand that can end up spreading out as like YouTube has sort of shown, you know, if you throw out a misconception and you don't address it and you don't address it head on and directly and, and as best as you can um, with educating that, then it's just going to continue to spread out and it will sort of indoctrinate an entire group of people, which is maybe not the best way. To That's have what's that happened happen. with the moon conspiracy. So, yeah. I mean, right? once, once, um, it wasn't really addressed until after, um, I can't remember who, um, I, there was some major, one of the major TV channels here in the U.S. decided that they were going to do an hour-long documentary about how the moon landing wasn't real and then air it in prime time. And that kind of talking about like Mythbusters? Kick started everything. No, this was before Mythbusters. This yeah. was like in the 90s, just when things started oh. to really roll out um, with that. But then it's cool because you get things like Mythbusters that do directly sort of work against this idea. Maybe not necessarily against, but prove that the ideas that were being floated around and said in all these conspiracies have absolutely no holding anywhere not even scientifically it's just um to quote phil plate who has a great one um the scientific term is wrong 
So, <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty good. So uh, what do you guys think, uh, the internet community out there? Obviously, we don't want it. This isn't supposed, we don't want this to turn into a big, huge hate chat. Yeah. Or like, oh, you're obviously stupid. That, that's not the point at all. It's, it's an education point. It's a, it, this is wrong, so how do we fix it so it doesn't turn into another, uh, the government is against it, so it's a huge, giant conspiracy. You know, no, the earth is round. How, how do you work that? And I think a lot of valid things are, you can't just say, you can't just show them a picture, because we've tried that. Apollo 8 has a great picture from the moon, yes. looking at the Earth. It's Earth very rise. clearly around, Earth sure. rise. But, I mean, CGI. Yeah. Sure. I mean, they just... Right? The... Exactly. So you can't show them a picture. Uh, <clears throat> is bringing them into space the th best way to... And someone's going to say, bring them into space, launch them inside. No. Is bringing them into space and letting them see the Earth themselves, is that going to fix it? Is education here on Earth better education here on Earth going to fix it? What are the best ways to go about this that aren't hateful or spiteful, but actually informative and can fix a potential problem as it's cropping up? Yeah. Or is this an unfixable problem? Is there just a desire to be... Contrarian, yeah, I guess exactly. is the best way to say it. And no matter what, no matter what we say, no matter what we show them, no matter what proof is put in front of them, they will never, ever believe it because they don't want to. Is that, is that the alternate, and it's just impossible to fix? Leave your comments on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, wherever you want to. We yep. will not, I promise we won't use a clickbait title on this because we don't, we don't want that. We don't want the wrong kind of community coming here. We want people eager to, who, who don't want to, who are willing to be wrong and say that I'm wrong and yep. want to learn and want to expand their knowledge. So anyhow, that, that's kind of what we're looking for. All right. Interesting, interesting topic. Any yeah. final thoughts? Can I just say one last yeah, thing about this? Um, one last thing about the flat earthers is there is quite a few of them who do have an open mind and who do do a lot of research. But as soon as they find one point of evidence that uh, the whole space flight theory, that space flight is fake, they stick to that and don't uh, continue their research. Some of them, I've seen one particular guy who you know, you know, made the statement about, well, all the satellites would melt up there because it's you know this particular amount of degrees, and then later learned that without the presence of an atmosphere there to excite the atoms, the temperature wouldn't necessarily matter. And so he was just like, okay, so this is something that I stuck to for a long time as evidence against uh, space flight, and now I've, I've found out that that's actually false. So there are quite a few of them who are reasonable people. I think the biggest thing to this discussion is to not uh, let yourself get down to a label where you resort to name calling. Don't ever name call. Absolutely. Be completely reasonable, be completely calm, and if they're not willing to look at or, or explore other, other avenues or other evidence, then, you know, you, you can't really work with that. But those who do have an open mind, just be calm, be uh, gracious. This is still a human being that you're talking to who just unfortunately might have been misled. Absolutely. So, be um, civil. Keep that in mind. If you're not going to be civil, then who will? And, uh, and not being civil and resorting to name calling uh, and belittling people is not how you create the next generation of humanity. That yeah. is not how you want to be treated. It's not how anyone wants to be treated. Um, I know I've been wrong many times before, yeah. probably in this show, so, like this exact episode. So <laughs> I, I, you know, so and I don't want to be belittled, but I do want to learn from that. So assume that they want to do the same thing, and you, you hit it dead on. If they don't want to learn and they just want to stick to their point, just stop the conversation. Just walk away. Yeah. You don't have to be right. Just, I mean, you are right. Just. You don't have to convince them. Just walk away. Just yeah. walk away. All right. On that note, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always oh God, looked what have to I the done? stars. They guide us. Give us comfort. Help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energy. Tranquility Base here. The 
Many think we stopped exploring, but we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with comments from our last show, I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow. These are the people who've contributed $2.50 or more to this episode. They're also going to get uh, a copy of After Dark as soon as that is available online. And uh, but they're oh, and of course their name of the show and access to um, the uh, hopefully quarterly uh, Google Hangouts that we do with the crew of tomorrow. Uh, just kind of just an exclusive little hangout that we'll do from time to time because there are rewards for crowdfunding the show. But wait, there's more. We've also got our patrons of tomorrow. These are people who contributed one penny. That's right, one penny up to two dollars and forty nine cents to the uh, tomorrow shows. So even one penny gets your name in every episode. Thank you so much to everyone for contributing. You are the lifeblood of this show. For more information on how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, let's go ahead and get started with comments from our last week's show. Comment Lord! <laughs> you know when that will live, you'll live that down? Never. The 12th of never. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this one comes from Ben Hamilton. Good name, Ben. Good oh, name. So Strong, solid name, Ben. Ben, you know, I can Landing tell Ben is a good character. Intro. He's a good person. Okay, no, that's good. So He's the next good... one is Adam, also <laughs> off of YouTube. <laughs> I'm sorry, no. What was Ben's comment? Yeah, when will the F9 landing be added into the intro? Yeah, so um, so if you look at the intro, it ends in like 2010. Like all the cool things that we did, like up to 2010, and then like there's nothing from 2010 up through 2015. Because nothing's happened. Nothing's something. happened, apparently. I think the show of tomorrow should probably update that. So I'm thinking, uh, actually, love your comments. So um, the Falcon 9 stage one landing seems like a good thing to add in there. I think the Blue Origin stuff seems like a good thing to add in there. Uh, what else should we add in there? Ooh. Landing of Dragon Cygnus docking to the space station. Cygnus to space station, landing uh, of Curiosity. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was a good one too. Although that, that's in our promo video. That but, is too. Yeah, so. but it probably should be in the intro. Okay, what, what else? So leave it in the comments like, between 2010 and 2015, we need some more stuff that was like epic and awesome for humans in space. What should those things be? New Horizons as well. Yep. Oh yeah, 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 that's a good one. Might as well include Dawn one. with series. Yep, yeah. yep. So we got lots. At, there's lots of stuff, but like pick. I can probably only fit like two or three in there, right? Because I still have the same amount of time. So that's true. Filet. Filet. <laughs> Filet. Filet. Maybe the like the uh, the animation, like the little uh, cartoons they did. Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah so cute. Uh, Next up, this one comes from Adam off of YouTube. Hi, Adam. <laughs> hey, Adam. <sighs> I don't trust Adam as much as I trust Ben, though. Okay. I don't know why. <laughs> there's, there's something about Ben that just made him feel super trustworthy. I don't I don't know what it was. I'll assume the Russian engine persons got the go ahead as an executive decision that was probably made, but that SpaceX aren't real reliable yet and they need those launches so the idea being that uh they were able to sneak in the bill because spacex isn't ready and we needed someone else to something something i am not sure that quite makes so I, I think this was this was just uh a single senator working against everyone else to be good for his district actually there are good valid points on either side which is yeah. you do need to have the, the u.s can't shouldn't be relying on just one provider mm -hmm. and by eliminating these engines you're kind of eliminating a provider so that's kind of silly also yeah. the whole idea that yes we're forcing you to use these engines oh no you can't use these anymore that's a little bit silly on the other hand the way they went about doing all of this was totally sketchy and it yep. was it was kind of douchey on on all Party's fronts, like the the reallocating of engines from military to non-military, even though there's no restriction on the non-military stuff, they didn't need to do that. That was purely a political move. So it, it was it was just, I don't know. Ev everyone involved just did weird, bad things, and it makes me sad. Is just makes me sad. There we go. Yeah. 
It's not a good situation. It's not a good situation. Yeah. Uh, Next one. Comment Lord. Yeah. Comment Lord. Comment Lord. Uh, uh, Ryan Ham, off of YouTube. Ben. Stop trying to include <laughs> Jeff Bezos. Don't add him to the list of reusable orbital rocket purveyors. Mastin, McDonnell, Douglas, Grasshopper, Grasshopper 2, Morpheus, even the Lunar Lander Trainer. Heck, and Spaceship 1 and 2 to that list. There's the Space Shuttle and the SRBs. And Solid there. rocket boosters. The X-15 and the true rocket that was recovered. And this isn't new stuff. Please shut up about Blue Origin. No, I completely no. disagree. Yeah. So first off, you don't have to like Jeff Bezos. That's fine. But there are still hundreds of engineers that are working at Blue Origin that did something that hadn't been really done before, yep. which is a propulsive landing of a stage back at its at its landing or launch site. Yeah. The X-15, the DCX didn't... Uh, DCX you go to the did the space. A, well, yeah, it didn't. So it only was, went a couple kilometers. Yeah, it didn't so. go nearly as high. Yeah. Right. So, and that's ultimately what this is. It went higher than anything else. I don't think we're saying that no one else has ever done this before. What we're saying is that this these vehicles that sent something to the border of what we consider the edge of space. Yes. Barely. Someone brought up in the last show in the comments, like, did the um, did the first stage make it to that 100 kilometer line? Or was it the spacecraft that made it to the 100 kilometer line? I actually don't know. I would actually assume it's the spacecraft that did it and not the stage. Anyone know for certain? I Yeah, I don't know. I'm assuming spacecraft based on, I would assume I would just imagine what the physics it would be. But who cares, stuff. right? Because yeah. it's not the stage that you need to get to that 100 kilometer line. It's the spacecraft that you need to get there because that's what's going to carry the people. So it doesn't matter. They did something that no one else had done before, mm -hmm. and it's really freaking cool. Yes. So I don't really care if you like Jeff Bezos or don't like Jeff Bezos. A lot of engineers spent a lot of time and put blood, sweat, and tears into this thing, and they did something great. Exactly. And I just want to add on to that, that, that's, that this whole thing seems to come from the attitude that spaceflight is some kind of zero-sum game, which it's not. The total, everybody's success helps everybody out. All ships rise with the tide. Yes, exactly. There you go. Comment Lord! Oh. This one comes from Stephen Fiddler off of YouTube. Ben, next launch and landing, you need to take a dB meter in with you and add it to the video shoot showing how loud it gets at the SpaceX mission control area. That's a decibel meter to uh, it'll measure the amount of audio. Uh, <laughs> I'll just tell you, it's like louder than a jet engine. It's insane. Nice. You can shout to the person next to you and not hear yourself. It's crazy. That's However, <laughs> that's not normal. Right? Yes. There isn't this, you, what you saw doesn't happen on every single launch. There is always a crowd, people are always excited, and there's always cheering. But that level happens when you do something epic, right? When a brand new epic thing happens. And it happens more than once at SpaceX, but it doesn't happen for every single flight. So I could bring a meter and capture it, but the next flight, especially if I wasn't running the webcast and I was in California. I would just drive up, I wasn't in California, I wasn't in, in um, uh, Galactic Headquarters, I would just drive up to the launch site and watch it in person, because there's nothing like watching, a, there's nothing like watching a rocket live, right? Yes. You can't, there's no camera. It's amazing. You, you, there's no camera that can capture it right, there's no, no. microphone that can capture the audio no. right, you no. just have to experience it in person, and it is truly an experience. It's, an, it's the ultimate, to me it's the ultimate raw display of power. It is just, it is, we've literally taken fire to its furthest that it can go and then controlled it to do something and do something unbelievably precise as well. So it's, just, it's the best thing ever. So. It's the best thing ever. So yeah. I would just personally go up and watch it in, in, at the launch site and I'm, yeah. I'm sure that other uh, people at SpaceX have the same thought. So I think that the, the energy will be moved p potentially to the launch site. Yeah. All right, next up. This one comes from Fabio Milan, also from YouTube. Also a very... Fabio comments a lot, mm -hmm. so yes. thank you, Fabio. Like, good, you. solid comments. Thank you for being a solid commenter on the show. Continue. Absolutely, thank you. <laughs> uh, you're talking about the curvature of space today, and really, literally today, I stumbled on videos <laughs> of people questioning SpaceX, saying it's fake and that flat Earth is flat. At first I thought those were satire, but then I realized that they were serious. We need people in space now. We need to save ourselves from this kind of ignorance. You know what? I just realized I developed the topic of the show after I put this comment in the show, and mm -hmm. I should have put this comment up at the main topic mm -hmm. because I think we just covered this to death at the main topic itself. Yes. Uh, but Fabio, I completely agree. Yep. Absolutely, you're, you're dead on. I, I think putting people in space, like mere mortals, not just at like, but putting you and I in space would go a yep. long way. 
All right, leave your comments on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, wherever you like. Now remember, we are off for the next two weeks. Two weeks. We will not be here for the next two weeks. I believe we return January 30th, 2016. Yep. Uh, for our next live show, we look forward to seeing you then. You're going to have a space pod in between. I will. My space and pod is uh, pretty cool, too. You're having the next space pod next week, basically, in essentially in place of this show, right? Uh, well, I think Ish. actually Space Mike's having it first, and then I'm, I'm sorry. doing so it So, Space Mike, so, you have yours yeah. first. Yep. And mm -hmm. what are you going to be talking about, Space Mike? Yes. What am I going to talk about? Yeah. Yeah. That's a surprise. Ooh, all right. So, surprise space pod next week. In I actually have two ready, and I'm going to be producing it at the last minute, depending on if a certain rocket launches with a certain payload. So, mm. we'll see. Interesting. All right. And you, Jared, what are you going to be doing? I'm actually going to be talking about uh, what it's like to go to a rocket launch, since we were just talking about this. Because mm -hmm. um, I will be at the launch of Jason 3 from Vandenberg. How far away from the rocket will you be? I will be 2.4 miles away from the rocket are just about four kilometers from the pad is that the closest you can get to a rocket of that size in the united states yes i will and be not closer than you can get at kennedy space center by miles yeah, so well the closest it's going to be get amazing by a mile so oh yeah roughly well but actually that's the, not true i was going to say but by now you'd have to you'd have to be on base yes all right so uh, but even then like it's about three miles away you yeah. have, but off base you're right it's by miles if you yeah. if you don't have a ticket Absolutely. on base yeah it's gonna be pretty amazing and i'm looking forward to it because this is gonna be my 12th launch i'll see in person and i saw the first uh falcon 9 1.1 fly in flight six so i get to see the last one now too nice That'd little really bookend cool. and i'm really excited all right thank you everyone so much for watching uh, stay tuned. After Dark is up next on the other side of that disc, and we'll see you in two weeks. Three weeks.